Thank you for all attending for your patience and understanding. We will now resume with the rest of our agenda. Next, we have the approval of the December 17th, 2020 and January 21st, 2021 Human Resources Committee meeting minutes. I will now ask board staff to call on any testifiers who have signed up to provide oral testimony on this agenda item. Committee Chair Takeno, there are no oral testifiers for this agenda item. Okay, since there are no testifiers, uh, we will move on to discussion. Again, I would like to remind board members to raise your hands on WebEx and wait for me to call on you before unmuting your microphone. When you are done speaking, lower your hand. I will continue these reminders as we go through the agenda items to help keep us all on track. Um, are there any revisions to the minutes? Seeing no hands raised, can I get a motion and a second to approve the minutes? Board member Kaimana Barkase. Aloha, board member Kaimana Barkase. Um, move to approve the minutes of December 17, 2020 and January 21st, 2021. Board member Kenneth Wimura. Uh, Chair, I second the motion. Thank you. It's been moved by Kaimana Barkase and second by board member Kenneth Uimura um, saying there's uh, no objections. Uh, the minutes are passed by unanimous vote. Um, we will now move on to action items on our agenda, starting with the action on the recommendation concerning the appointment of the complex area superintendent for the HANA Lahaina Luna, Lanai, Molokai complex area. I will now ask board staff to call on any testifiers who have signed up to provide oral testimony on this agenda item. Committee Chair Takeno, there is no oral testimony for this agenda item. Thank you, Gina. As there's no further testimony, um, on this agenda item, we will move on to discussion. I would like to now call upon Cynthia Cobell, Assistant Superintendent of the Office of Talent Management, um, to introduce Deputy Superintendent Phyllis Unibasami to present the department's recommendation. And I also understand that the candidate, Ms. Rebecca Winky, is also here if the committee members have any questions. Hello, so, Chair Takeno. This is actually Superintendent Kishimoto to introduce this item. Uh, and uh, good morning, uh, board members and members of the public. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce to you a new complex area superintendent candidate for the Hana, the Haina Luna, the Nai Molokai complex. After 13 years of dedicated service to this complex area as CAS, and 30 years in the DOE as teacher, vice principal, principal, and CAS, Lindsay Ball will be retiring. And today I present to you a quality candidate to join my leadership team to continue his work. First, allow me to extend to Lindsay Ball deep appreciation for his leadership, commitment, and voice in bringing forth the perspective and needs of a unique and wonderful part of our state. CAS Ball, I also want to acknowledge and mahalo you for remaining in this position through this health pandemic to help see your team of principals through this through difficult decisions. It has been a personal honor to work with you, to visit schools together, and even to take in a football game at Maui High School with you. Board members, today's candidate is Rebecca Winky. She is on the line as well, so that uh, you may ask her questions or ask her to speak. Uh, in the memo, I outlined Dr. Winky's accomplishments that align with the leadership skills and expectations of this important leadership role. Dr. Winky has served in the DOE since 2003 as teacher, vice principal, and principal. Currently, she is in her fourth year as the principal of Nahe, 
Nahi'ena in a elementary school. Dr. Winky has a long, successful education career. Previous to joining the team at the DOE, she served as teacher, assistant principal, and principal in the state of Georgia. Principals and complex area staff were actively involved in providing input during the search process. The search committee consisted of principals from Molokai, Na'i, and Maui, peer CASs, community members, and the committee was chaired by Deputy Superintendent Una Basami. I had the opportunity to review interview notes, candidate applications, and I conducted the final interview as well that was recommended by the committee. There were noted areas that were very important in feedback from the community. There was a desire to have someone who understands the community, its uniqueness, and its goals. The team clearly seeks a leader with a passion for and commitment to equity. The complex area wants a team player that will continue and build upon the work accomplished to date focused on student outcomes. The interview committee noted that Dr. Winky has demonstrated outcomes in, the, in this area, including in these areas, including building a positive school culture, uh, supporting and leading the design of the Kaipuni program at her school, advancing strategies, interventions, and deliverables focused on access for all students and closing the achievement and working on towards closing the achievement gap. As has been my practice to ensure good transition support into the CAS role, I will be placing Dr. Winky into a deputy CAS position for the rest of the second semester so that she is coached and transitioned by CAS ball. I look forward to Dr. Winky joining the 14 other members of our talented CAS team. I appreciate your consideration of this appointment today and encourage you uh, to uh, allow Dr. Winky also to make some comments or answer your questions. Mahalo. Thank you, Superintendent Kishimoto. Um, so we'll, does um, the candidate want to make a presentation now? Good morning, Chairperson Takina. I'm very pleased to be here with you today. And um, yes, I would like to let you know how appreciative I am of this opportunity. Nothing would make me happier or motivate me more than to represent and advocate for the four unique communities that comprise the canoe complex. As the superintendent stated earlier, I've been in the complex since 2003. I've worked on two islands and have worked in three of the 11 complex schools. And I have been very much a part of the community on Lanai and now in Lahaina. Um, in my years here with the Canoe Complex, especially since I joined the leadership team, I have realized what a special complex this is. Um, our current complex area superintendent has really fostered strong relationships between the administrators and he has built a sense of community where we work together collaboratively to move our complex forward. And that's one of the unique qualities that has attracted me to this position. I could not dream of being a complex area superintendent for anywhere else except Hana, Lahaina, Luna, Lanai, and Molokai. It's a very special place to me and it's home for me and it would be an honor to serve in this role. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Rebecca Winky. Uh, before we start discussing this agenda item, I'd like to again remind committee members to raise your hands on WebEx and wait for me to call on you before unmuting your microphone. When you are done, please lower your hand. The committee recommends, excuse me, the department recommends that the committee approve the appointment of Rebecca Winky as the complex area superintendent for the Hana Lahaina Luna Lanai Molokai complex area effective July 1st, 2021. May I get a motion to approve the recommendation? Or member Maggie Cox. Maggie Cox here. Thank you, Chair. Uh, 
I move to uh, recommend. I move for our um, committee to recommend to the full board the exception of Winky for the complex area superintendent. And I I think that it's wonderful that she has been involved with this complex all this time, and that really does, as she said, make it a special thing. Thank you. Thank you, board member Cox. Um, board member Kaimana Barkasi. Hello, board member Kaimana Barkasi. Second the motion. Okay, it's been moved by board member Maggie Cox and second by board member Kaimana Barkasi. Uh, we are now um, in discussion. Uh, any of the board members have uh, any questions from the super of the superintendent or the candidate? Uh, Ms. Rebecca Winky. Board member Maggie Cox. Uh, sorry, I got I get my hand down. No problem. Um, board members, uh, we are in discussion. So does anyone have any questions? Again, of the superintendent's recommendation or of the candidate. Uh, board member Catherine Payne. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Dr. Winky, for stepping up and taking on what I know is a very, very different role than being in a school with, with teachers and children, but very important. I, I'm wondering what you see as the most critical um, effort that you're going to need to make as you step in to a leadership role for this complex area? Thank you, Board Member Payne. Um, the number one area that needs to be addressed is equity and access for all students in this complex, um, especially coming through this pandemic, um, the virtual instruction and learning from home has highlighted some of the disparities between our students and what they're able to come to school with. Um, in a lot of instances, educators and the school system serve as equalizers to, to enable every student to have the same opportunity. And that is my number one priority is to do what's best for students. And I look forward to doing that. Thank you very much. Maybe if you could, I could just follow up with you a little bit on that. And if you could tell us like what specific actions do you think would be most helpful in addressing that uh, concern that you just described? Yes, of course. I th because of the uniqueness of our complex, a lot of the traditional measures and the traditional modes of doing things don't always serve our communities well. And I think what our state superintendent and our 2030 promise plan has highlighted is that we need to empower our students and our teachers and to provide opportunities of innovation where they can grow and succeed in ways that we don't necessarily know that they need. If we give students voice to try things and to chart their own path and, that, and we facilitate their learning, they may go well beyond our expectations. And, and I do have high expectations for all. I think a lot of times we just need to get out of the way of learning. Sometimes traditional education may stifle creativity and innovation. And I think we have tremendous growth potential in the area. Thank you, that's, that's encouraging and I appreciate your comments and I yield. Thank you, board member Payne. Any committee members have questions? Uh, board member Kili Namal. Aloha, board member Kili Namau here. Um, Principal Winky, aloha. 
<laughs> I do know you a little bit I'm, because you are the principal in my district. And um, I know that you have been a principal at um, Princess Nahiana Anna for a few years now. I did not know that you had been on Lanai as well. Uh, could you share a little bit about your experiences being on Lanai, if you, if you could? Yes, of course, board member Nama. Um, I, I arrived on Lanai in 2003 just happened to, to discover the island when I came on a trip to Maui and took the ferry over and fell in love with the place. And so soon pursued the opportunity to join um, the school there. I began as a middle school teacher and later was the registrar on that island. And being on Lanai, you, you realize the challenges and some of the difficulties of being on a remote island. I have experienced times when the barge can't come in because there's a, a terrible storm and you have a child and you can't get milk. You know, so I, I've been uh, deeply a part of the community, but also the challenges that face a school system and a K-12 school system at that. Having when I first got there, it was nearly 700 student enrollment and funding a K-12 school is, is much different than 700 students at a K-5 elementary school. You know, there's unique challenges trying to, to put together a complete high school program and offer all the CTE opportunities that you want to have for those students. Um, but, but living there and being the registrar there, I will have to say, you know, these things that are normally barriers really provide opportunity to do something out of the ordinary. And one of the great things that has been, um, they've been able to do on Lanai is really pursue dual credit, dual college credit and high school credit. And that has grown since I've left there. I, I understand recently we've had students graduate with 60 college credits, you know, and a complete associate's degree. Um, it's, a, it's a very tight knit community and I will have to say, you know, it's, it's like my Hawaiian home. It's where I was here for 11 years before I moved over to Maui and um, it's just a very special place. <laughs> I, I could go on forever. I don't know if there was something specific you were wondering about, um, but I would love to answer any more specific question that you might have. Thank you. I so appreciate you sharing your experiences. It's um, it's wonderful. And I'm glad that you had that opportunity to serve there, especially since we all know that this canoe district is a very, very special CAS. Uh, um, I mean, a, for a CAS. I mean, it's, a, it's, an ex, it's an extremely complex complex as we know it. Um, through the state, no one else will be, you know, is is experiencing anything that this particular CAS has to go through by commuting, going to different islands, the different, the different communities themselves are very unique in themselves, high populations of Native Hawaiians, for example, and definitely very community oriented. So I'm pleased to know that you understood that by your time in Lahaina. I do have some additional question, questions of you in regards to immersion education, because we do have many schools in this particular complex that have uh, and house immersion programs. Now I know that you are at Princess Nahiana Ena and there is a um, Kaipuni immersion program there. Could you tell me a little bit about um, your experiences in uh, working with the Kaipuni program there and any highlights or insights as to how you would operate with the other uh, programs in, in this complex? Yes. Um, well, when I came to Princess Nahiana Anna, I had no prior experience with a Hawaiian immersion program. But of course, you know, I'm in love with the Hawaiian culture and I, I love 
being able to share that with our community and for students to have the opportunity to be educated in the Hawaiian language. I, I just think that's an awesome opportunity for all of our students. When, initially, just like I would do with most any situation, I try to learn more about the program and listen. And we have um, Kumu who've been there many, many years and who are experts. And I listen to them on what they think the program needs. And one of the areas that I have been focused on in the four years there was to attract and retain licensed teachers. And I'm pleased to say that this year we have five Kumu who are all licensed and the program has grown. Most of our classes had maybe 12 or 13 students and now the past three years, the, the classrooms have 20 to 25 students enrolling. So it is, is growing. We've also built a new building for the school that was just finished and opened this year that houses the entire Kayapuni program. And we had a dedication at the beginning of the year. Every year we have our special day to honor Princess Nagyana Inna. We have our May Day program and we could go on and on and on. Within that, the Kumu are the the experts in the area. I'm sort of the, the guide on the side that, you know, I try to keep in touch with policy and, you know, school policy and procedures and to make sure we stay on track with that. But it's a, it's a collaborative relationship and, you know, I listen to them and try to help them move forward. And I would like to see that continue on all the way up K-12. We have programs at every school, but as our students move up to the next level and we have more and more students enrolled in the program, I see great possibilities in the future. Thank you. Um, Dr. Winky, just one last um, question. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with the FAFKI document? Yes, I am. Good. And you have read it and you understand it. <laughs> I don't know that I understand it as, as much as someone who um, has been in this program forever, but I have participated and collaborated with the teachers, I would say for the Lahaina complex, it's been very much driven by the Kumu, but we have offered information and we are supporting the efforts to complete that document. Okay, great. For those of you who are not aware what that is, it's a document for the foundational ed and administrative framework for Kayapuni education. And it's good reading for all the CASs as well as principals who are uh, who have immersion programs at their schools. So I really appreciate you, um, Dr. Winky. And should you be um, approved today, I'm looking forward to working with you. Mahalo. Mahalo. Board, board member Namau, are you yielding the floor? Your hand is still up. Yes, I okay. thank you. Thank you. Uh, board member Lynn Fallon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Dr. Winky, um, I, I was very, very um, encouraged uh, in, in how you uh, identified your number one priority around equity and access. Uh, and um, it's an area that, you know, the board and the department have uh, highlighted as a priority. Uh, in, in describing some of the specific actions that uh, you were looking at, uh, one area that the board has, major area the board has responsibility for, almost primary responsibility is around looking at policies and uh, changing them, modifying them, creating them where there is need. And in doing so, uh, we've been looking at uh, working with the department in areas like looking at better metrics uh, to um, measure progress. And I'm wondering, uh, you, you uh, had uh, stated that 
the traditional measures don't always uh, serve the school and the students as well as we would like. And you'd like to see uh, empowerment uh, of the school and teachers and uh, facilitating learning, uh, working with students. And I'm wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit more about uh, what, what other measures we might look at so that we as a board uh, understand uh, the success and the progress being made. Thank you, Board Member Fallon. Um, some of the other measures, I guess the key thing that would go across all of K-12 is how to increase student-driven learning and having student voice in setting their own goals and, and how that's going to be measured. And I, I think that can be done even at the kindergarten level you know, to a, a limited degree, they can they can figure out what they want to learn about and they can compare it to their own rubrics and they can see where they are and set a goal for the end of the year. A lot of that can be done through opportunities to have student led conferences. Um, to have exhibitions of learning when they're doing something out of you know, out of the textbook, but when they're doing a project and project based learning and, and that can tie in with the place based learning. And I think if they could have opportunities to exhibit their work with authentic audiences, students will be um, will strive harder and and they'll be more excited about the outcomes and being able to share their work with others. I think authentic learning experiences is what we need to see more of. And then as we get into the high school, some of those authentic learning experiences could be internships with businesses in the community or with nonprofits and community organizations. So I, I don't know exactly what the metrics would be besides you know, the percentage that are involved in doing that. Um, but I think you know, in a collaborative way with working with other like-minded people, we could come up with measures that could um, give us a gauge on how much of that's going on in the community. Thank you very much. I yield. Thank you, board member Fallon. Um, just for everyone's uh, attention, um, you know, we have uh, several other agenda items, uh, three more on the agenda. So if you could raise your hands, uh, uh, a little bit more expeditiously and keep your questions concise. So from there, uh, board member Kenneth Wimura. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair Takano. Uh, given your comments, I may have to cut my comments and questions now, but, and I will do so. Uh, I wanted to address uh, some comments and questions to uh, Deputy Superintendent Unibus Amigas. Uh, I think you did uh, a lot of the legwork on this recommendation, and also to the candidate, uh, Rebecca Winky. But let me just start because some of, I, I know one of our uh, committee members had already mentioned this, and that, you know, this complex area in particular is very important because it represents the inequity concerns that the board have, you know, the neighbor islands and the rural schools. So, uh, you know, we kind of, we, we want to make sure that uh, there is an advocate uh, in this position that would advocate for the small and rural schools. Now, the memo recommending Rebecca uh, Winky references her skill set, deep knowledge, familiarity, but her resume does not align with the comments nor the position description of the CAS. And this just may be an oversight because I know the resume is kept to one page, so there must be more detail or experiences that can be related to some of the, uh, the position description uh, and the comments that was included in the memo. So currently, I don't have the re requisite information yet to support the recommendation, but would appreciate obtaining that information and getting to know the candidate more. First of all, to get comfortable with the selection, I would like more detail as to the process used to make the selection. How many candidates? 
order to agreed upon questions. And if you're familiar with my question, line of questions over the previous uh, as candidates, you know, I have asked those questions and uh, previously and in the last two candidates that was uh, recommended and approved by the board, these questions was, were, were answered. So we kind of regressing in how we present our candidates to the board members because you know we need to know as much as we can because the CAS position, as we all know, is an important position in our organization structure. I mean, they're they're like uh, the superintendent because they're CAS, they're, you know, coming air superintendent. So they have a lot of responsibilities. So we have to make sure that the CAS complex they're responsible for, we have the right person in there. So, uh, so first of all, to get more comfortable with the selection, I would like more detail as to the process. And I talked about the candidates and uh, what questions. And also, uh, candidate uh, Winky, can you uh, align your experience to, to each major duties and responsibilities and the essential functions? Um, we get a lot of general comments, but we don't have, at least I don't get the feeling that I know you well enough that you can address some of these uh, uh, comments or uh, like I said, the position question. So um, so maybe I'll start off and have Deputy Superintendent Unabasami answer my first set of questions. Aloha, um, board, um, board member uh, Uemura. Um, so my apologies if it if, if fell short of your expectations. However, I did use the last two memos on um, complex area candidates uh, recommendations, um, knowing that you were pleased with those and um, pretty much tried to follow the same, same um, line of information. Um, I hope that this is not a reflection on Dr. Winky um, and her um, ability and capabilities to serve as the next complex area superintendent. Um, so let me just start off with um, some of the questions that I that you asked. Um, there were 16 candidates that were brought um, that applied for this particular position. Um, we did take them through a video um, screening uh, in which all 16 were invited to respond to. Out of that, um, six of the candidates rose to the level of getting an interview with the um, selection committee. The selection committee, if I can give a little bit more de detail to that, represented um, not only myself, but two complex area superintendents who serve on neighbor islands, who serve in remote areas and understand the work, the unique work of um, serving in on neighbor island and in remote areas um, in, in ways that only they understand. So they served on the committee. Um, the second was that we brought in um, principals from um, each of the islands. So Maui Island, Molokai, and Lanai. And then we also know, knew that um, it was very important to have community members. And so we asked um, uh, a community member from HANA, who also um, works for a Native Hawaiian nonprofit, uh, to serve on the committee because we know that uh, a large population uh, of uh, HLLM is Native Hawaiian. And so um, two of the members from the committee are, are Native Hawaiian. Um, the other one is someone who is a, has a long time partnership with this community, um, sorry, the complex area. And he um, represented the business uh, 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 partners. Uh, so that made up the committee. Um, so we felt very strongly that um, it was very important that every uh, part of the complex area was represented on the committee and by some some member of the um, by some member of, of the committee member um, committee. Uh, second is that um, while I will not share the questions because the questions really. Uh, are, are, are tailored um, uh, in, in such a way, not only to the position description. So I, I can read you the headings and the committee not only got the information that came through the conversations with um, the principals from that complex area, when we asked them, um, given the work that you're doing now and the future work ahead, uh, 
knowing the directions that are in Strive High and um, being set um, as expectations for the Department of Education and the things that they value, what is important for us to know on the committee, what is important for us to know that we need to um, pay attention to. And the principals gave us that information. We then went to the complex area um, team and it did a similar conversation about what is it that you want the interview committee to know. We captured all of that information, gave the committee not only the raw notes of the um, of the conversations, but also gave them um, the, the, the position description and a summary of the, the notes from the conversations. So they had that piece of information. I also gave them a straw man of questions, um, more than they could uh, ever ask um, in, in the interview. And so what we did was then we went through and given the titles um, in the position description, selected the questions that were most closely, according to the interview committee, aligned to those sections and to the look fors that um, were given by the HLM, HLLM uh, leaders. Uh, Deputy Superintendent, let me just stop yeah. you because I, yeah. I just wanted to get a flavor. So you can see the importance of the questions because, you know, I'm hopefully one of the questions you ask is, you know, uh, what are the issues you see in the complex in your eight years uh, in the complex and how would you address that? That you would ask all of the candidates so that uh, because so so when the when the committee sees the question at least we know that there's been asked that you know maybe that's the question you know because we're asking these questions now and, and probably you had already asked them based on what you're telling me now is that correct i mean you, you guys did a broad general base of questions that revolved around responsibilities and issues in the complex is that correct Uh, Deputy Superintendent. Oh, so sorry. I was talking, but I was I didn't unmute. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was I was just trying to make sure that you know. I, got, yeah. uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I just want to yeah. make sure so, for the committee that we kind of you know we kind of covered mm -hmm, all of that. Mm -hmm. But that's the reason mm -hmm. for asking that question because yeah. uh, we need to know exactly yes. how to answer some of these questions. Right. Yeah. So so there's two parts to the. Um, to answering your question. Number one is yes, general, because there, there were national um, and local candidates um, that were being interviewed. Um, so there was um, a generic general um, looking at um, being able as an executive leader, being um, a leader in a system of leaders. Um, but then there was also an expectation by the committee that um, this person would know and understand the unique challenges that um, were faced by not only the communities, but by the schools and by the um, team of leaders that served in that area, because they would be the senior leader in that area. So there had to be this um, understanding of the uh, issues and challenges that would they, that that person would face. And so there was two parts to that. Um, and in each of the questions as they were had put together um, serve to give that com that our committee um, a sense of how th this leader, this candidate would operate in this particular complex area. Thank you. I don't know if I answered all your questions, board member, but if you could ask a follow up if I did not. Sorry, I had, I had myself on mute. Sorry, I just wanted to get a flavor of the question and the process you went through. So one one last question for you. How many candidates did you surface? Uh, I know you had six. Did you cut it down to two and then gave two to the superintendent or was this your candidate? You just came down to one. So we, oh. Yeah, I well, I gave the whole package to the superintendent. Um, it was very clear um, in listening to the conversation of each member 
um, on the interview committee that um, Dr. Winky was unanimously heads above all candidates in terms of from their perspective and the way she responded to the questions. Um, at, so much so that um, they felt very, they wanted me to present to superintendent how much um, each of them felt um, she was um, a, the top candidate. Um, and so while I forwarded all six names to Dr. Kishimoto, um, I also had an obligation to share with Dr. Kishimoto um, the strong desire by the committee, each committee member, um, and how they viewed Dr. Winky, because they did um, spend a lot of time with all of the candidates, um, spent a lot of time in discussion, and we could not, you know, um, not rep I could not um, dismiss it and not represent them well um, to Dr. So, yeah, so, so, so the, your, your basically your procedures was to recommend six versus because if you had all of your committee members so strongly for uh, one candidate, well, why wouldn't you just recommend it one candidate? Uh, but I think what you're saying is your procedures was to submit six and then have Dr. Kishimoto uh, select one. Is that correct? Um, no, my I did not recommend all six. I, I forwarded the six names. I always forward who got interviewed. Um, I forward the uh, the the um, findings by the committee. Um, but I always want Dr. Kishimoto to see what the committee saw so that she can make her own decision. And I do tell the committee, you are not um, selecting the um, candidate. Um, we are making a recommendation and base it on the findings of, of, of our work. Okay, so you sort of didn't answer my question. You sort of did, but didn't. So you you didn't make a recommendation, but yet, but yet you just said the committee's responsibility is to make a recommendation, but you submitted six with no recommendation. Right? No, I, I'm sorry. I did some, I did not recommend all six. I was what I was saying, trying to say. I, so, I give yeah. Dr. So how Kishimoto. Many you, how many did you recommend? Uh, One. Oh, so you recommended uh, Dr. Winky. Dr. Kish, Dr. Winky, based on okay. the committee's work. But okay. I also okay. give her, I give to superintendent all six yeah. so that yeah. she can take a look at, does she, in looking at the committee's work, is she, um, she has that ability to see the work that they've done and then yeah. further decide what questions she needs to, what she wants to ask um, as she does her final selection. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Deputy Su Superintendent. This is this is for uh, uh, Dr. Winky. Uh, can you, uh, you know, when I looked at your resume, uh, you left a lot of things in there, but there was no detail to that. So I wondered if you could, you know, real quickly uh, give us give us give us a flavor of how your resume aligns to the position rec uh, requirements. Yes, thank you, Board Member Umura. Um, when looking at the job description, one area is executive leadership for student achievement. You know, and while I have not been in a CAS position before, there's a, a similar um, role at the school level where we're looking at student achievement. And as I worked at Princess Nahiana Inna, I led our school through our very first um, accreditation review process, you know, and through that process, the school identified areas of, of weakness, areas of growth, what we need to improve on and concrete steps for moving forward. And based on what we presented to the WASC accreditation committee, we were given a six years of accreditation, which is the highest level you can get. Um, and through that, one of our outcomes that we were beginning to work on was a, an initiative for school-wide responsive response to intervention. And we were able to set that up and we had set up data teams for each grade level <clears throat> in a process of looking at data and doing common formative assessments and moving forward in that regard. And another area is accountable empowerment of schools. And I have been at the school level seeing what we already do in the complex 
and with our academic and financial plans, we have quarterly reviews where the complex area superintendent, uh, a representative from the complex resource team and the principal and the leadership team at the school work together to look at the academic plan and look at what we've made progress on and what we haven't and what are the barriers and what are what are steps that the complex area team can do to support the school also um, another accountability system is our school community council that meets regularly and has community members and certificated staff and classified staff where we share the academic plan and the financial plan and get community input um, feedback and performance evaluation of leaders in the complex area I've been on the receiving end of that and I see what happens at the complex area and it's very similar to a principal leading in the school we we work with our our teachers through the educator evaluation system and we have two roles in that um, not only are we evaluating and correcting and leading our teachers but we also provide them support and give them professional development to improve their practice and we serve as thought partners when we observe their work on what do we see and how can we support them and all of this you can just pull up one level to the complex area and then another area is systems for talent management within the school level i, I would say that has been one of my strengths is recruiting and retaining teachers my very first year at the school I had to hire 14 new teachers. Last year, I hired four, but two of those were newly created positions. And as we're going into the teacher transfer period for this year, I don't anticipate having any vacant positions. And, and consistently it's come up and even teachers have told me that they, they can tell that I really evaluate the candidate to see how they can fit with the team and that they're strong and they're gonna bring something to the table to improve our school. And to me, that's a, a key aspect going into the complex area superintendent position is you cannot be hands-on with every single thing. You have to surround yourself with qualified and talented individuals who can help move your vision forward. And then the last area is operational leadership. And I, I feel like that's another area of strength that when I went into this position, you know, I had no background in it, but I have a strong head for numbers and I, um, I have a, I would also say put with that, I have a strong moral compass and I make ethical decisions and I do what's right and I follow policy and I would carry that on to the complex area level as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Winky. I, I like your last statement very much. So, I'm, uh, Chair, I'm going to yield the floor. Um, thank you, uh, Board Member Uimura, and thank you, uh, Ms. Winky or Dr. Winky. You know, based off what we have on the agenda, I'm going to recommend that uh, we continue this conversation because I do have some questions also, but um, due to the length of time that we have this meeting scheduled for a general board meeting. I think we should continue this conversation during the general board meeting if Dr. Winky can make herself available. Would that be a possibility, Dr. Winky? Yes, it would. I'd be glad to. Okay, so um, I just wanted to get everyone's thoughts. Could we just move this conversation uh, to the general board meeting so we can move on with our uh, remaining action items, and if so, I would need a motion for that. For member Catherine Payne. Um, I think you're muted, board member Payne. My my apologies. I uh, so moved. Okay. Board member Kenneth Weimer. I second that motion. Okay, it's been moved uh, by board member Ch Payne and second by board member Weimer that we move this discussion to the general board meeting. Um, 
Is there anyone, uh, was there any objections to that? If not, the motion's approved and we'll move on to our next agenda item. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Winky, for your participation on this. And thank you for making yourself available from later this afternoon. So the next uh, action is the recommendation concerning the declaration of the annual reduction in force for classified employees to initiate collectively bargain placement rights for employees displaced due to changes in staffing needs. I will now ask the board staff to call on any testifiers who have signed up to provide oral testimony on this agenda item. Mahalo, committee chair, Takeno. Susan Piccola Davis, followed by Randy Pereira. Susan Piccola Davis, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, Susan, I can hear you. Please proceed. Hi, sorry. Um, on this particular agenda, agenda item, I'm opposed to it uh, due to the fact well, first of all, I know there's time constraints in order to, for the notification. I understand that part. The other caveat to this is that um, my understanding was that there were going to be uses for the ESSA money to go ahead and restore all the teacher positions or all the positions that may have been re reduced. There are two current bills in the legislative process, SB 270 and HB 613. And what they're doing is they're trying to offset any budget reductions that are identified or proposed by the DOE and the governor that would result in a, a RIF. <clears throat> and so what's happening is that this is happening at the same time. I'm not sure that a delayed decision will not result in additional costs to the department. And um, the department's principals have determined staff reductions are warranted upon consideration of the needs of our students. However, when the money was returned, or I'm not sure if it has been returned, but the money that was supposed to be returned back to the schools, I'm just wondering why there's still 103 employees that are still not going to be taken care of but by the funding. So that's one of my questions, although because of that question, that's one of the reasons why I am opposed. And I'm not certain that the schools or the complex areas were given guidance to restore the positions because I've understood that they've had a lot of autonomy, uh, but the concerns right now in the public are that we really don't want to lose any of our staff right now. So consideration of probably postponing any decisions would be a good idea in my opinion. Thank you very much. Randy Pereira, Hawaii Government Employees Association, HGEA. Randy, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Please proceed. Uh, good morning, Committee Chair Takeno, Vice Chair Barcarce, and Committee Members. My name is Sanford Chan. I'm an Executive Assistant with the HGEA and providing testimony today in opposition of Agenda Item 4B. The H HGEA opposes this agenda item regarding the request by the Department for the Board of Education to authorize the commencement of a reduction in force for classified employees whose positions will not be funded for school year 2021 through 2022 due to lack of work need or funds. We understand that this authorization request before the board occurs annually and upon approval allows the DOE to move forward in a timely manner to implement any reduction in force actions that are necessary for positions that will not be funded for the next school year. However, it concerns us that the information before you this year is not accurate and current. 
the proposed reduction in force of 103 permanent classified employees, most of which the DOE has said would be educational assistance in bargaining unit three, is based on the initial 10% budget reduction that has since been revised to a 1% reduction at the school level. As you can imagine, being identified for a reduction in force and notified of a layoff causes affected employees increased stress and anxiety when they face the possibility of not having a job to return to next school year. With our understanding that the majority of the weighted student formula funds and all of the special education per pupil allocation monies will be restored, we urge the board to direct the department to update this reduction in force recommendation before taking action on this agenda item. Thank you for the opportunity to provide input. Committee Chair Takeno, no further oral testimony on this agenda item. Thank you, Gina. Any written testimony on this agenda item is publicly posted on the board's website. With public testimony on this item being concluded, we will move on to the discussion. I would like to call again Assistant Superintendent Covell to present on this agenda item. Before we start discussing this agenda item, I'd like to remind committee members to raise your hands on WebEx and wait for me to call on you before unmuting your microphone. When you are done speaking, lower your hand. So with that, uh, Assistant Superintendent Covell. Uh, thank you, HR Committee Chair Pequeno and uh, to Vice Chair Barcarcy and committee members, uh, good afternoon. The department would request authorization from the Board of Education to commence a reduction in force for these classified employee positions, which will not be funded in school year 21-22. And I appreciate the uh, comments from the testifiers. We do have updated information. As you know, the board memos post before, uh, a week before. So we, the 10% the reduction to the schools was reduced to 1%. And the principals had some time to relook at their financial plans. So some of these positions have been um, restored, not all. Uh, as of today, we have 60 positions that have been um, still identified for a reduction in force based on things such as enrollment, principal priorities, moving funding around, and um, the work that's necessary. So we, we still want to come and ask the, the committee to take action on these 60 positions. The other uh, piece of good news, I think, is that the classified positions that were restored uh, are in excess of 160. So we think those are some vacancies that we could start once the RIF process is approved to make placements for these 60 uh, impacted individuals. So um, we're just going to continue to request. Again, this is an annual process. Last year before COVID, in February, we came and asked for uh, authority for 45 uh, positions to be reduced, and um, we, we placed all of those. So we expect with the restored positions from the money that went back to the schools um, and hope that, that these will be placed. I also want to point out that for these positions are state level. We did not restore the 10% reduction to the state. And um, two of these are from EOEL, and they're waiting for the legislative process to conclude and may end up um, not, uh, may be able to restore those positions. But for now, um, they, they know that they're on the list. So with that, uh, we'll continue to look at if any of the reductions from the 60 go down, we, we will reduce those people from getting a letter sent out but I, I would like to ask for the, the committee's approval today so that we can start the timeline to, uh, to place these individuals and, and notify them by April 1st. Thank you and I'll stand by for questions. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Covell. The department recommends that the committee authorizes the department to commence a reduction in force for classified employees whose positions will not be funded in the 2021-2022 school year due to a lack of work, need, or funds, as described in Superintendent Christina Kishimoto's memorandum, 
May I get a motion to approve the recommendation? Seeking a motion to approve. Board member Catherine Payne. So moved. It's been moved by board member Catherine Payne. Could I get a second? So I'm looking for a second so we can enter into discussion. Uh, Board member Keely Namau. A second. Okay. It's been moved by uh, board member Catherine Payne and second by Keely Namau. Um, we're now in discussion. Um, any questions for Assistant Superintendent Covell? Is there any questions from the committee members? Board member Catherine Payne. Yes, thank, thank you, doc, uh, Dr. Covell. Um, I just had a question about be, waiting for the funds. You, you mentioned EOEL is waiting for the legislature and um, there may be some other funds that are coming forth that could change the picture. Will the individuals have an opportunity to return to their original placements if those funds are forthcoming? Or will they be placed and then the school or the agency, particularly EOEL, where they may be particularly trained as others are for those specific positions, will they be able to return to them if the funds become available or will they be permanently moved? Thank you, uh, Board Member Payne. It, it, it depends on the timing. So if um, they have not restored the positions and they they themselves the employees look for another position um they will they will stay in that new position but at any time during the process between you know april 1st and, and the end of june if they get an indication that they are going to have the adequate funding um that can be rescinded so it, it, it really depends on the timing thank, thank you very much and i yield Thank you, board member Payne. Um, board member Maggie, Maggie Cox. Thank you, Chair Maggie Cox here. Uh, is it possible to hold off this decision until our next meeting to give us a chance to give uh, all these employees a chance to see if more money is gonna come down? Because um, I've been in a position where you're telling people they're not gonna have a job next year and then you turn around as they're as they've stressed out a max to the max and then you turn around and go oh sorry now i have enough money and you can have your job back so um everybody is so stressed these days if there's any way to alleviate some of the stress i would be for that so i guess my question after all this yakking is what is the consequence if we hold off until another meeting I yield. We know that a number of these are not based on the funding reduction. Um, some of them have made priority choices, a couple uh, buying other positions. So they're not all going to come off the list. And, you know, it was 103 and it's down to 60. So I think it's actually um, better for the employees to be able to get notified if the number goes down some we hope it will um they'll they'll be notified and they'll be uh, taken off the list but it, it really does help us because these positions that were restored by other schools now have become open for placement so the longer we delay in the positions uh and right now there's 60 at risk the longer we delay in trying to place um it it, it will cause uh them uh less time 
unless we extend them through the fiscal year, uh, then it will cost the department, um, you know, another month's salary and it delays the whole process as we get ready to start the next school year. So typically we, we do the placements and have everything done before the beginning of July. Um, and there will still be some number that do uh, need to, as I said, the state positions, and there's others uh, that are not EAs, they're library assistants, and they've made these decisions based on projected enrollment and what their needs are for the next school year. So it would be, it would be smarter to authorize the RIF in my, in my view, and then um, work case by case where, uh, where we can start placement when we know those positions won't be restored. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Covell. Um, board member Kenneth Oymura. Oh, thank you, Chair Takeno. So, uh, so Cindy, uh, just to follow up on uh, Member Cox's question. So the answer to her question is, it could be delayed, but it's better not to. Is that correct? It, it could be if the board chose not to approve it and to come back uh, next month, but it will delay uh, the notification to employees and therefore it'll delay the start time and right. we won't be, um, we'll have to fund those positions for another, depending on when it gets approved by the board, you know, okay. at least another 30 days. And so you don't have a number as far as uh, a dollar range if you have to fund that positions? We, idea? we estimate um, about, depending on the exact the position and the person's seniority in the position, Right. It, would, it could be between three to five thousand a month per per position. Per position, and so yes. if you're looking, so so and so if you get if you look at the sixty positions, then do you have a breakdown between work need or funds? We we work with our personnel regional officers at each complex, and they work with the schools. Yeah. So they they have. Um, they're, they're still working closely with them on, on all to see, you know, is this, what is, what is the reason for the reduction? Um, some of them have reduced to 0.75 instead of a whole position. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's different reasons, but we, we, we know what they are for each position, uh, working yeah. with the pros. Yeah, so I guess what I'm asking is that, obviously, if it's a funding issue, that's different than a need issue, right? So it'd be good for the board to know that. Uh, and secondly, I know uh, this is an annual thing and you're uh, in the past eight year, 99%, but does that include, because there's bumping rights included. So does it include the 99% include the people that were bumped? Did you find positions for that? The, the, because the 99% placement of the 45 last year, and yeah. those are those were put into vacant positions. Okay, so there were nobody bumped, right? Uh, let me follow up and make sure. I, my understanding is there were not. Yeah, but in I'll the memo, it says in, in the past eight years, the majority, 99%. So yeah. you should have some kind of data on that. And But the right. main reason my question is really, um, you know, we go and there's a, a reprioritize on your bumping rights, and you say 99%, but the guy that getting bumped, does he get it? Does his job get filled? I mean, does he does he get to find another job? I mean, that's important to know, right? Yeah, the the bargaining rights they are allowed to get offered a position, and if yeah. they turn that position down. Um, yeah. they, they can choose not to continue to work with us. Okay, and that's so why you it, said it's really the employee's decision. Yeah. Yes, and last okay. year, um, Board Member Amar, we gave the board a, a IOU to show where those people were placed, so I okay. can send that back again, too. Okay, okay. Uh, I think that's uh, my uh, extent of my questions, and I think I kind of echo, we can delay it as long as possible. And, and obviously, I would like to see a breakdown between work need and funds, because that'll give us give the, the board a better idea of exactly what positions are really in jeopardy. 
because the funding side could be cured, right? So anyway, uh, Cindy, thank you very much. And I'll, uh, Chair, I'm gonna yield the floor. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent uh, Covell and Board Member Uemura. So, you know, I did have some questions about that, that, you know, wanting to understand what positions were slated based off of the lack of need, or, you know, basically the position is not being sought after versus funds and wanted to know if that could be bifurcated where those based off needs should be sent now. And then the ones with the funds, we could hold off a little bit longer and what would be the overall cost. But I think those questions were uh, somewhat answered by Assistant Superintendent Covells. But do we have any other questions from any other board members? Um, if not, just a follow up question. So, Assistant Superintendent Covell, based off the concerns that uh, were late stated in the testimony. Can we get regular updates as to, you know, the, like you said, it's been reduced now to 60 positions and what these positions are and basically whether or not there's a breakdown between it's a funding issue or if it's a need issue and when can we expect that type of information to be conveyed to the board? We, we, it changes throughout the process of placement uh, as people, re, you know, decide to retire or move. So it's a, the numbers will change, but we could provide you a snapshot and break it down um, of the 60 that are currently on the list, either as an IOU or, or next month, but the number will continue to change. Um, we, we don't notify the personnel until we get board approval. So we would not uh, want to share that position um, publicly until we have the authority um, to to start the process. But we could certainly categorize the positions by need. And when you say funding, um, some of the principals choose for funding reasons because they might have bought two extra EAs and they don't see those needed next year. And they'll say it's a funding issue, but they're reprioritizing their funding. They're using the funding in a different position. Uh, some buy more teachers, depending on what they're projected for their uh, next enrollment plan. So uh, it, it may be categorized as a need, or it might be a principal priority funding decision. Uh, but the funds were given, released back to them, and this is what the decisions they've, they've made. So, and there are a number of vacancies, so it, it is important to, to start placing people um, so that we can fill the vacancies as well. Okay, thank you, um, Assistant Superintendent Covell. Uh, before I call upon uh, Board Member Cox, I just would want to remind our committee members that um, we have quite a bit of testimony on some of the remaining agenda items, so we really got to move this uh, meeting quickly or else we will run directly into our general board meeting. So uh, with that board member, Maggie Cox. Thank you, Chair Maggie here. Um, I'll be quick. I just, of the 60, how I would like to have known how many are EAs and you said there were some that were library assistants and whatever. And so you didn't give us any of that information. So that's all I would like to say is, do you know it right now? Yes, I have a list of the positions. The majority are EAs. Special ed or just regular ed? It, it's both, but primarily special ed. Um, board member Cox, do you have any further questions for the system? Oh, no, that's why I Got okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, committee members, any further uh, questions or discussion on this? If not, I believe we are ready to vote on the motion. I will now be taking a roll call vote. Committee members, wait until I call on you and unmute your microphone. 
when your name is being called. So committee vice chair person, Kaimana by Carse. Aye. Committee member, Maggie Cox. Nay. Committee member, Lynn Fallen. Aye. Committee member, Kili Namau. Aye. Committee member, Catherine Payne. Aye. Committee member, Kenneth Uemura. Nay. Okay. And committee member, Bruce Voss. Aye. Aye. Okay, the motion passes. Well, with five ayes and two nays, so it's been approved. Next, we have action on the recommendation concerning compensation adjustments for the Department of Education employees excluded from bargaining unit 13, coded as unit 35. I will now ask board staff to call on any testifiers who have signed up to provide oral testimony on this agenda item. Committee Chair Takeno, there is no oral testimony for this agenda item. Thank you, Gina. All written testimony on this agenda item has been publicly posted on the board's website. With public testimony on this item being concluded, we'll move on to the discussion. I would like to call again Assistant Superintendent Cindy Covell to present on this agenda item. Uh, thank you, Chair Takeno. Uh, this particular item has to do with asking committee action on compensation adjustments for Department of Education employees excluded from bargaining unit 13. We call them bargaining unit 35 and they are excluded managerial compensation plan EMCP employees. Um, these these because they're not uh, because they are excluded, we do follow the BU 13 bargaining unit um, contract for the uh, adjustments. And so we're asking for the committee to consider uh, approving these compensation adjustments for these 28 positions. It is about $170,000, which we did confirm was in the collective bargaining uh, allocation received. So the funding is there, and these are very um, much strong leaders in the department and are requesting that the board approve this compensation adjustment for this group of employees. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Covell. Before we start discussing this agenda item, I'd like to remind all committee members again to raise your hands on WebEx and wait for me to call on you before unmuting your microphone. When you are done speaking, please lower your hands. The department recommends that the committee approve the salary updates, compensation adjustments, and tentative agreements for excluded managerial compensation plan employees excluded from bargaining unit 13 and coded as bargaining unit 35 as described in superintendent Christina Kishimoto's memorandum with a retroactive effective date of July 1st, 2019. May I get a motion to approve the recommendation? Um, board member Catherine Payne. So moved. And board member Maggie Cox. I second the motion. Okay, thank you. It's been moved by board member Catherine Payne and second by board member Maggie Cox. Um, is there any discussion? I'll quickly go down the list to see if there's any hands. Oh, okay. Board member, Catherine Payne. Yes, I just wanted to clarify my understanding is that this is something that is actually, we should have done back in the summer because that's when the contracts took place and it's fairly routine that this is done. So these folks have um, not had the pay raise that was given to the other bargaining units. and so. This is really just a corrective action that we're taking right now. Just if that could be clarified, because that's my understanding. I yield. The, um, I'm sorry, do you, do you want me to address that? Please go, assist, please go ahead, Assistant Superintendent. 
Okay, the the timing on this was a little different because the um, agreements, the funding through the legislator um, did not come at the normal time. So I think we got the approval uh, late September and we brought the first group forward um, in November. The, the governor issued um, an executive order for his EMCP folks and uh, they moved on that. And uh, we have, have, have really three groups. We have the BU313 that we brought in November. Those were the secretarial pool that's excluded, um, less pay, not excluded managerial. So we brought the first group uh, and all of these will be retroactive. So they're not missing any money. It's just the, the timing. So we took the first group in November. We have this group now, and we still have a group that hasn't been addressed and that's the leadership team compensation. So the normal process would be as the, as the CBAs are approved every four years. I think we came in 2017 when that was the, you know, what, it depends on how the contracts go and this one is really over two years. And so, um, that, I, I don't know if that answers the question. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Covell. Um, any further questions by any of our committee members? Um, seeing none, at first I'd like to apologize on behalf of, um, well, apologize for me as, as being the HR chair that we did not get this on the agenda earlier. Um, and I apologize to those who um, are in this uh, BU 35. Um, we appreciate um, all your dedication, your commitment, and your efforts, and um, this is sorely needed and recognized. So um, thank you, and, and again, I apologize for the delay. With that, I would like to uh, take a vote on this motion. So seeing no further discussion, I'll now be taking a roll call vote. Committee members, please wait until I call upon you to unmute your microphone as you cast your vote. Committee member, uh, Vice Chairperson Kaimana Bakarse. Aye. Committee member, Maggie Cox. Aye. Committee member, Lynn Fallen. Aye. Committee member, Kili Namau. Aye. Committee member Catherine Payne. Aye. Committee member Kenneth Uemura. Aye. And finally, committee member Bruce Voss. Aye. Okay, thank you. The motion has been approved unanimously. Finally, we have action on the recommendation concerning a new superintendent employment contract. Before we take testimony on this item, I would like to note that the committee only consulted the board's attorney on legal matters related to the superintendent employment contract. The committee did not discuss what action it would take or individual members positions on the matter as those discussions were reserved to take place during this agenda item in public. To be clear, the HR committee has not predetermined its course of action. I will now ask board staff to call on any testifiers who have signed up to provide oral testimony on this agenda item. It's my understanding that the, uh, again, the time limit is three minutes. So, um, Gina. Susan Nicola Davis, followed by Rebecca Hadley Schlother. Derek Nakami, Sherry Nakamura. Susan Piccola Davis, can you hear me? I can. Please proceed. I understand that we're down to the wire on time. And um, I've noticed that other agenda items have, have been shortened on discussion 
because of the time limit. So I have a concern about that, but um, as far as this um, agenda item, I'm opposed to offer the current, I'm opposed to offering the current superintendent a new employment contract. Um, I've expressed in past meetings my concern with some of the judgment calls that a superintendent has made. And the, in the most recent two weeks, we have heard first, uh, we're gonna continue on track as we are doing right now. And nothing is going to change until the next school year. Now, the next thing we hear is that I could be wrong, that Every, they're going to try and get everybody back into the classrooms on March 22nd. Okay, so now we have to ask, as it has been stated, no longer do we need a six foot social distancing. Uh, Dr. Kimball has said, or somebody did, two feet is appropriate. We haven't addressed the ventilation. Some, people, some classrooms have had um, ventilators put in or the air, air cleaners. With all the kids in class, think about it. How is the cleaning gonna get done between classes? Intermediate schools and high schools, they're going to be changing classes. The concerns of parents is that they want their kids back in school. The concerns of teachers are that they would like to see the kids, but there's no uh, reassurance that all of the required CDC implementation recommendations are being exactly followed. So there's a lot of concerns. And so therefore, I think that um, maybe our superintendent needs to be replaced. We'll have a lot of um, repairing of things that get damaged between now and if her, if she's not uh, renewed or selected again, because there's gonna be a lot of damage control. And jumping hoops, we're back to where we were last year. Everybody's going back to school after spring vacation. Oh no, no, two more weeks. Oh no, August, oh no. I mean, I'm sorry, but all of this jumping around is causing everybody a lot of stress. It Rebecca Hadley Slosher, followed by Derek Minakami. Rebecca, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the Human Relations Committee. My name is Rebecca Hadley Schlosser, a proud special education teacher at Nani Kapono Elementary and a proud member of the Hawaii State Teachers Association. I'm here today to speak in relation to the concerning the new contract for Superintendent Kishimoto. I strongly urge you not to renew Superintendent Kishimoto's contract this year. She's proven over the course of the last year that she does not care about her employees. She has pushed to open schools with, a, with an insufficient plan in place to ensure our safety. She's attempted to discontinue shortage differentials that were e effective in reducing the shortages. Trainings for teachers at the beginning of the school year were hastily thrown together and in some cases had either broken links or numerous videos on the same topic. Despite Superintendent Kishimoto saying schools have sufficient PPE, I have two friends who are special education teachers at another school who have repeatedly told me that they do not have sufficient PPE at their school and they are personally purchasing things like child sized masks and disinfecting wipes to use in their classrooms because they are not being provided with them. Superintendent Kishimoto has failed to fulfill her promises to ensure the safety of all school staff and students. She's pushing for schools to open fully when it is obvious that all schools are not ready. There are currently 171 schools that have less than a 60 day supply of PPE in one or more categories according to the department's metrics. Too many times over this past year, you've had to give Superintendent Kishimoto a directive to retract a decision that she has made. 
Even the school principals have indicated that they're not receiving timely communication from her. This makes their jobs more difficult. When Superintendent Kishimoto was initially interviewing for the job, teachers in other states who had worked under her were telling us that she was not effective there. We told you we had those concerns with her back then, but she was hired anyway. The pandemic has unfortunately proven us right. She is ill-equipped to lead us moving forward. We need a strong leader who has previous classroom experience and understand what it takes to lead Hawaii's school system into becoming a more effective school system. Thank you. Derek Minakami, HGEA, Sherry Nakamura, He'e Coalition. Derek, can you hear me? Aloha. Derek? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, please proceed. Thank you. Aloha Board Chair Payne and members of the Board of Education. Mahalo for this <clears throat> opportunity to share my testimony. I'm Derek Minakami, principal of Kanyohe Elementary School and president of HGA Unit 6. I'm speaking to agenda item 4B, 4D concerning the new superintendent um, employment contract. Please know that this is not something I find easy nor take delight in. In fact, I find it very regrettable that I must express our grievances about our superintendent in such a public forum. Yet, after sharing our needs and frustrations previously with leadership to little avail, as President of HGA Unit 6, I feel compelled to speak. In the past, we asked to have our voices included when decisions affect how we are to keep students and staff safe while attaining high levels of learning. We also asked for clear and consistent direction that all schools should be implementing. While we appreciate the goal of empowering school leaders, when it comes to health and safety, there should not be much variability in what is expected. Instead, we hear of decisions once they have already been made and after they've been released to the public. We're then left to make plans without clear guidance, leading to a disparity of implementation, such as with graduation ceremonies or the implementation of blended learning, leading us as school leaders to suffer the comparisons made by parents and the public. Further, the lack of consistency has resulted in the inability to secure the resources needed to implement decisions in the timelines provided, such as sanitizing supplies and equipment at the beginning of this pandemic, or the computers and hotspots need to provide equitable access to distance learning. For example, the directive to bring all students back to in-person learning for elementaries during the fourth quarter was announced last week to the public without first seeking input from school leaders. Then two days ago, once the figurative horses have already bolted, we were asked to share concerns. Principals brought up a variety of obstacles, many specific to their campus and geographic area, that impact a safe reopening to all schools, including having students eat unmasked while still providing at least six feet of space, for guidance regarding the maximum number of people we can fit in a confined space if they're um, limited to three feet apart. While we appreciate the opportunity to share, we believe this should have come well before the public announcement so that we could have help in the planning and preparation. But now we are still wondering if what we shared will have any impact on the statewide call to action. Call to action. I think, you'll, I think you'll find that school leaders are solution oriented and compliant. We'll bring up concerns, not so much as a reason or means to block actions, but more to make, help make better decisions that lead to a successful implementation. We accept that our ideas will not always be agreed to, and then we do as we're told. Unfortunately, we have not experienced this type of relationship with our superintendent. And uh, while what pains me most is that I still believe in her vision for empowering schools, I and the rest of the HGA Unit 6 Board of Directors cannot in good faith endorse her reappointment. Mahalo for this time. Sherry Nakamura, He'e Coalition, Executive Director. Sherry, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Thank you. Aloha Chair Takeno and members of the committee. My name is Sherry Nakamura, Director of He'e Coalition. I'm commenting today on Action Item 4D. He'e Coalition would not support a new contract for Superintendent Kishimoto, and we explain our reasons in our written testimony. Some may say that it may be unfair to evaluate the superintendent's performance during this unprecedented situation of COVID-19, as there were many things that no one could control. However, we believe that the pandemic was a superintendent's opportunity to rise to the challenge and provide the leadership we needed 
to get our schools through this crisis and do the best job for our students. But the superintendent did not provide effective leadership. The schools bore most of the burden and performed remarkably in spite of the lack of guidance, support, and communication. The superintendent has lost trust from the community, teachers, and above all, the principals. If there is no confidence in our leader, there is no way our system will thrive, and in the end, our students will ultimately suffer. We urge the board not to offer the superintendent a new employment contract. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Julie Reyes Oda, followed by Corey Rosenley, Mike Landis, Caroline Frudig, Shirley Yamauchi. Julie Reyes Oda, Nana Kuli High and Intermediate. Julie, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Mahalo, please proceed. My name is Julie Reyes Oda. I'm a math teacher at Nana Kuli High and Intermediate School and a public school mom. I'm commenting on recommendation concerning new superintendent employment contract. I am so conflicted. I feel a pit in my stomach publicly speaking about a woman in a position of power who spoke of taking bold actions because I know that when you do, there's a risk of failure. And after, there's a long line of people who'll be there to criticize you when you fail. And I don't wanna be one of those people. I know there's gonna be a lot of testimony today, both written and in person over WebEx. I'm not gonna pile on a girl when she's down. Dr. Kishimoto, thank you for your service. I think you know where this is going, right? And I'm so sorry it's gone down this way, but it is evident that the discussion on the superintendent's contract has, has exposed hard truths about our educational system. This is the story of how the power of one person can have on such an impact on an entire state. And it's because Hawaii is the only statewide school district in the country. It's a tale of chaos, miscommunication, inconsistency, lack of transparency, and no accountability. There are no quick fixes to this. We have to admit there are systemic inequalities. The people who work in the system can't even be heard. We have to come to this board and submit testimony or speak in our time for one, two, three minutes. And that's not much in the way of active participation. We can't have a leader who leaves me in a position to answer a kid who asks me a question to sound like I'm giving magic eight ball answers. Mrs. Reyes, do you know if we're gonna come back to school next month? And I sound like my sources say no, or reply hazy, try again, or signs point to yes. I'm tired of giving these contradictory vague answers to kids. I bet principals are tired of giving it to parents. I take no joy in requesting that the Human Resources Committee report to the full board that the superintendent contract not be renewed. Thank you. Corey Rosenley, Mike Landis, Caroline Frudig, Shirley Yamauchi. Corey Rosenley, Hawaii State Teachers Association President. Corey, can you hear me? Yes, Gina, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Thank you. To Chair Takano and members of the Human Resources Committee, I'm Corey Rosenley, President of the Hawaii State Teachers Association, representing 13,500 educators across the state. It is never easy to come out and suggest that someone's contract should not be renewed. This is even more difficult for teachers whose job it is to care for and nourish our public school keiki. But I will share that this weekend, once we saw it on the agenda, HSDA's board of directors, made up of volunteer elected teacher leaders from across the state, voted unanimously to ask the Board of Education to not renew Superintendent Kishimoto's contract. I'd like to remind the Board of Education that this is not the first time we have shown that we have um, concerns about Superintendent Kishimoto's actions. In August of this school year, HSDA board of directors adopted a no confidence in Superintendent Kishimoto's leadership in safely reopening schools. I do wanna thank the Board of Education. Over the last school year, the Board of Education has had to take numerous actions in, over, in order to overturn decisions made by the superintendent that could have had serious ramifications for our Keiki, 
and our schools. With the most recent action occurring just at the last board meeting, when the BOE voted to overturn the superintendent's memo on differentials. She chose to send out the memo, even though the differentials were highly effective, highly effective had BOE support, and before exploring the possibility of additional federal stimulus money. I wanna share that in our testimony, we included uh, poll research for more research of a principal survey that was just conducted and finished recently. That also shows, and you have heard today, the concern from principals as well. I don't wanna belabor our point, but within our written testimony, and I hope you'll look at it, we have included 12 examples that shows why HSDA has concerns and why we've come to this decision. We ask the Board of Education to not renew the superintendent's contract. Thank you. Mike Landis, Caroline Freudig, Shirley Yamauchi. Mike Landis, HSTA, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, Mike, please proceed. Aloha, Human Resources Committee. My name is Mike Landis. I'm a social studies teacher at Lahaina Luna High School, and I serve as the HSTA Maui Chapter President. I speak to you today on behalf of Maui teachers in particular and the Hawaii State Teachers Association in general. We're asking you not to offer a new employment contract to Superintendent Kishimoto. I'm saddened to give this testimony because just one year ago, I felt I had the privilege of meeting with the superintendent at the state capitol as we were both there lobbying in support of efforts to recruit and retain teachers. I had such high hopes for her and for our public school system, then, but that moment feels like ages ago. Unfortunately, what teachers have seen from her since then is a lack of leadership. Her employees, our students, and their families desperately need leadership that we can trust, but that trust has been broken time and time again. Over the past year, I've been contacted by Maui teachers on a near daily basis about the DOE's lack of leadership so much consistent concern from Maui teachers that I had no choice but to join my fellow members of the HSTA Board of Directors in taking a position of no confidence in her leadership in safely reopening schools and in now opposing the renewal of her contract. The superintendent's leadership through the pandemic has been marked repeatedly by failures to communicate to her employees and the public. Her so-called communication to the public about COVID spread in our schools is a cause of major concern in the community with the media only able to report on her vague statements of a positive case of somebody somewhere in a complex area. School principals around the state have complained about the difficulty of running their schools with this poor communication. Her communication regarding telework is so lacking that we have a free-for-all situation with different schools having completely different telework procedures, some of which include blanket denials of telework for teachers who do not even have in-person instruction responsibilities and yet nothing is communicated by the superintendent to ensure consistent and fair telework policies. And let's not forget her communication about planning to use a third of the federal funds to hire private tutors while slashing school budgets, and her communication about planning to unilaterally uh, eliminate the differentials for teachers in critical shortage areas. These particular communication issues caused so much concern from our teachers who feared that they would lose their ability to provide for their families. While they were also basically being called crybabies for wanting some basic safety considerations during a pandemic. The superintendent has also shown to be an unwilling participant in her own legal obligations during this pandemic, except when she's had her hand forced by the BOE or threats of legal action. She negotiated and agreed to the legally binding memorandum of understanding for educators to return to the classroom during the pandemic. And yet how many teachers has the BOE heard from over the past year? just to get her to abide by the very things she agreed to. How many hours that could have been spent focusing on the needs of our students, but were instead spent on items that were clearly spelled out in the MOU because she simply refused to follow them. And now she's violating her legal responsibility to engage in successor bargaining for our next contract. Her entire presence in our contract negotiations included making some opening remarks and then leaving the first session and then not even showing up for the second session. This has resulted in a declaration of impasse and the need for federal mediators to get involved. What a sad and unnecessary state of affairs. Our public schools need a leader who has the trust of their employees, 
their students, and their families. Caroline Freudig, Shirley Yamauchi. Caroline Freudig, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Thank you. Um, my name is Caroline Freudig. I'm a first grade teacher on Koi. Thank you so much to the committee and Chair Takeno. I struggled with whether or not I should be doing testimony today, being that I teach a class full of distance learners. However, I have an amazing distance learner substitute teacher. And I knew that if I needed to be here for this, that I would, my students would be in good hands. And so I'm here to testify for the non-renewal of Superintendent Kishimoto's contract. Please understand this is not personal. However, it is very much necessary given the concerns that have been brought forth by the teachers and the communication failure that continues to happen that causes anxiety, confusion, and frustration. You might remember that back in July at the 23rd Board of Education meeting, I did testify there as well. And I spoke about the video that had been emailed to us on July 21st, where Superintendent Kishimoto spoke about all the schools being ready. And she was saying that all schools had what they need to reopen, yet I provided Kauai data sh that showed that was just not true. Since then, eight months later, here we are, March 3rd, yesterday, um, I was watching the piece uh, on from the Honolulu Star Advertiser from the morning where Superintendent Kishimoto was on. It was a great piece. It was a pretty good 30 minutes, I believe it was. And she mentioned about a, a meeting that took place and that meetings have been going on for the past two weeks about fourth quarter and that there was a great meeting held with Speaker Psyche, Senator Schatz, union representatives where there was you know, a collective cohesive call to action, which is all well and good. However, there's still no clear understanding on what's gonna be happening with what is in our contract about the six foot distancing because there has been no formal discussion. As a matter of fact, I believe the first meeting around that is actually taking place tomorrow. So again, communication is still not happening in a way that I feel would be the proper way to do it so that people have a clear understanding of what's happening. Yesterday at my school, my principal and on another school, another principal said that when they attended their statewide meeting on Tuesday with the state for all the elementary school principals, it was mentioned that they could have students in the cafeteria less than six feet apart eating lunch with their masks off which is a direct contradiction to what Dr. Sarah Kemble, the Hawaii State Epidemiologist, shared with us at our HSTA Board of Director meeting on Saturday, February 27th. So it left me wondering, is there new information came out? Are we missing something? How is it that at one meeting, the epidemiologist is telling us something, and then four days later, Superintendent Kishimoto or whoever the state people were, are telling our principals something else? I I just, I'm, per I'm perplexed, I really am. And so it's very concerning. And I ask that we please not renew Superintendent Kishimoto's contract. Thank you so much. Shirley Yamauchi. Shirley, can you hear me? I can hear you, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the Board of Education and Chair Takeno. I am commenting on number four, discussion item letter D. I am Shirley Yamauchi, 21 year teacher at Kapolei Middle School, grade seven elective wheel teacher on the blue track calendar. I am the Leeward chapter president and I have represented over 3000 teachers. I am asking that Superintendent Kishimoto's employment contract not be renewed. Back on August 15th, 2020, the Hawaii State Teachers Association told the BOE that the HSTA Board of Directors overwhelmingly voted to state that they have no confidence in school superintendent Christina Kishimoto's handling of the reopening of Hawaii's public schools. I am on that state board and I will still stand by that vote. Prior to my vote, I emailed Dr. Kishimoto asking what was going to happen to the three multi-track schools as we were scheduled to bring the, bring the students back shortly after July 1st, 2020. To this day, she still has not responded back to my personal email. As a Leeward chapter president, I'm humbly asking that Dr. Kishimoto's contract not be renewed. Thank you. Committee Chair Takeno, that concludes oral testimony for this agenda item.
Thank you, Gina. Um, we have also received written testimony on this agenda item, which is publicly posted on the board's website. With public testimony on this item being concluded, we will move on to the discussion. Before we start discussing this agenda item, I'd like to again remind committee members to raise your hands on WebEx and wait for me to call on you before unmuting your microphone. When you are done speaking, please lower your hand. Um, so, may I get a motion on this agenda item? Excuse me, Board Chair Catherine Payne. Thank you, Committee Chair Takeno. I move that we defer this item to a subsequent meeting to be scheduled in the near future so that there can be a full discussion on this item. If you like, I can give more thoughts on that if there is a second to this motion. Board member Kili Namau. I second the motion. Thank you. Um, there is a motion. Oh, excuse me. Uh, board member Catherine Ping, do you have your hand up again? Do you want to add to your motion? I do not want to add to the motion. I will participate in the discussion if you call on me. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> board member Payne. So it's been moved by board member Chain Payne and second by board member Kili Namau that the committee defer this matter to a later date so that they could have uh, further discussions on this. So there's a since there is a motion that was moved in second, we're now into discussion. So, uh, board member Catherine Ping. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, board uh, committee chair Takano. Because this is such a critical topic, I think the board needs to have um, time to fully discuss the issues that we've heard in the testimony. And there's a lot of written testimony and some of it ranges in, in all different directions, but I think we need to have time to think about that. And I think we, we need to have time to process some of the things that we're hearing. And we don't have time in this meeting because we're already up against the time for the general board meeting to start. So I would just, without um, making any, um, I, I don't wanna show lack of respect for all of the people who have testified because I truly um, feel your, your heartfelt testimony and your concerns, but I do feel like we have a responsibility to have um, more time for this discussion. And that's why I would like to defer it, but um, not long, but defer it to a meeting in the near, near future where we can have time to have this discussion fully. Thank you, Chair, I yield. Board member Maggie Cox. Oh, thank you, Chair. It's Maggie Cox here. Uh, if we do, in fact, end up deferring, I would like a date. I don't like it just being stated, you know, pretty soon. I think that it this is such an important topic that we need to make sure that we know exactly when we would be um, ruling on this. Thank you. I yield. Thank you, board member Maggie Cox. Committee members. Uh, board member Catherine Payne. Thank you, and I appreciate the comments from board member Cox. I think that she is correct. We need to take some um, action on this very shortly. I, I, it's hard to say exactly what date because we're going to need a quorum in order to do that. So I would say no later than March 15th. You know, that takes us to the middle of the month, but, um, you know, I think we can 
we have to come up with a date when everybody is able to be present. And so I, I would, or maybe within two weeks, we can make that uh, amendment to the um, motion. I yield. Thank you, uh, Board Member Catherine Payne. Board Member Kaimana Barkarsi. Hello, Board Member Kaimana Barkarsi. Um, you know, I, I do agree that this uh, committee meeting is, is running long, and I'm wondering if, um, since we're here and we'll be moving into the um, into the general business meeting, if, if uh, Chair Payne, you think that there might be enough time to add this discussion point to um, our general business meeting, uh, just as we did um, um, action item 5A. I yield. Uh, board member Catherine Payne. I think that we have a very full agenda coming up and we're going to be starting late. We can't start later than two o'clock, but we will be starting late. I think this is so important that it really does require um, more time than we're going to have available at the next meeting. And we have a lot of controversy about the school reopening, which I think needs our full attention. And I would like to um, respectfully request that we schedule a meeting just for this topic. And we do that um, no more than two weeks from now, but preferably sooner. Um, because I do think we, we need a little time to think about all of this and to come back um, very thoughtfully approaching our decision. I yield. Board member Kilina Mau. Mahalo, thank you. Board member Mau here. Um, I agree in that we should defer this. It is an extremely important topic. And I would prefer to have um if, if we can have some kind of a special meeting of some sort, perhaps, and, and have this have this on the on the the agenda and perhaps be the only agenda item that we discuss. Um, it's really important that um, we can be we have the time to be reflective of everything to take in further testimony. Um, and I, I think trying to discuss this today or to to add it on to our our agenda further in the afternoon. I think it's it's just not it, I think the it, it's a, it's not serving any of us well. And I really do want to focus on the reopening of schools, for example. So I if we can get this on a special meeting of some sort in the very, very near future, I would prefer to defer at this time. I yield. Board member Catherine Payne. Thank you. And I've been reminded by my um, Roberts Rules people who advise me here that we're not able to put it on the uh, full board, general board meeting agenda. Um, anything on that agenda needed to have been posted last. Friday, and because it's not currently on the agenda, we can't just move to add it to the agenda. So that kind of ties up that issue. Thank you. I yield. Thank you, Board Member Payne. Uh, board Member Kenneth Uemura. Yeah, I I, uh, I can hear the concerns. And the only thing that I would suggest is if we do defer this, that, that you have the full board or committees, not just a quorum. So in other words, you know, we need to get the eight or nine members in attendance. And it doesn't have to be on a Thursday. It has to be on a date when all of us can be uh, can participate. So that would be my, uh, my recommendation. Uh, Chair, I, I use the floor. Okay. Um, Board Member Catherine Ping. 
Yes, I, I agree with Vice Chair Uemura, and I think that right after this, this meeting is over, we will be working to find a day when everyone can be Thank you for emphasizing that, Vice Chair Uemura. I yield. Thank you, uh, Board Member Catherine Payne. Any further comments from the committee? If not, I would just like to comment as the chair. Um, there are some expressions from some of the board members that we would want to have this discussion um, in the very near future. But we have an open ended motion right now. Um, and I think we would need to amend the motion to basically put a date. Or deadline, if that's what the committee desires. So we would probably need to uh, vote on this motion and make a new motion, if I'm not mistaken. Board Member uh, Kaimana Barkarsi. Aloha, Board Aloha. Member Kaimana Barkarsi. I move to amend the motion to add in that this meeting will take place no, uh, no later than two weeks from today with the stipulation that um, at least eight of nine board members be present. I yield. And board member Catherine Payne. I, I'm just not sure if I need to withdraw my motion. I do concur with um, board member Bakarsi and I would second his amended motion, if that's the right thing to do. Robert's rules correctly. I am checking with board staff right now. Apologize for the delay. Um, apparently, since you are withdrawing yours, Catherine, I believe you're good. So I just need a second on uh, Kaimana's uh, revised motion. Uh, board member Ping. I, I think I can second it. And I, if so, I do second his motion. All right, it's been moved and second. Uh, any further discussion? Um, seeing no hands, um, I'm going to take a vote on the motion. I'll be now taking a roll call vote. Committee members, wait until I call on you to unmute your microphone to cast your vote. Vice Chairperson Kaimana Baikarse. Aye. Committee member. Maggie Cox. Aye. Committee member Lynn Fallen. Aye. Committee member Kili Namau. Aye. Committee member Catherine Payne. Aye. Committee member Kenneth Uemura. Aye. And committee member Bruce Voss. Aye. Okay, the motion has been approved unanimously. Um, as our final order of business, we will give members of the public who missed their opportunity to testify earlier to testify now, including do those signed up but were not in attendance, had technical difficulties, or signed up late. Members of the public who signed up to testify, you must be logged on to WebEx using the same name you use to sign up for testimony. Board staff will call on you in the order in which you signed up to present oral testimony. Board staff will unmute your mic. Please test your speakers and microphone before your name is called to ensure they are working. Instructions on how to do so can be found on the board's website. If you're not audible because of technical issues, you'll be muted and the next testifier will be called. Note that each individual may testify on a particular agenda item only once. 
If you signed up to testify multiple times on the same agenda item, your name will not be called. Testifiers will have a three minute time limit. State your name, organization, if applicable, and agenda item you are testifying on. A chime will sound when you have 30 seconds left and a second chime when your testimony time expires. You'll be automatically muted once your allotted time for testimony expires. I will now ask board staff to call on any remaining testifiers. Committee Chair Takeno, I have no oral testifiers. Okay. Thank you, Gina. Since there are no public testimony or further business on this agenda, this meeting is now adjourned at 1.41 p.m. Thank you for your attendance.